Welcome to the first ever episode of Looking Forward to Three Houses. Since Fire Emblem Three Houses comes out next spring, we have plenty of time to go through every game in the Fire Emblem series. We will be discussing what features we want from each game to make a return in Three Houses, and I will also include a basic review of each game so you can kind of see where I'm coming from in which aspects of each game I pick out uh, for Three Houses. So let's get started with Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, which was released in 1990. And the very first Fire Emblem game ever made, developed for the Famicom by Intelligent Systems, led by Shozu Kaga, who developed and directed the first 15, 15, first five games in the Fire Emblem series. And we'll talk more about when he left uh, in a later episode. So first, I just want to go quickly and talk about the presentation as a whole of Fire Emblem 1, or FE1. So number one, the 8-bit graphics are charming. Nowadays, 8-bit and 16-bit nostalgia are really popular, and it's a, it's a thing that we all look for in certain games. Like Octopath Traveler is a game that I am really excited for and play the demo and love. And I think part of that is because of that 16-bit, 18-bit nostalgia that I have for old RPGs and stuff. And the same could be said for the art and graphical style of Fire Emblem 1. But as we know now, it's, it's antiquated, it looks old, and... It, it runs kind of slow, the graphics are, the animations are just kind of clunky, especially like in battles. They're fun to look at the first few times, but man, it really gets started quick, right? It gets old very fast. The music is, again, good for its time. Uh, none of the tracks are partic particularly grating, but none of them are amazing and really stand out. It wasn't until Fire Emblem 1 got a remake in Fire Emblem 11, which is Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon, that the tracks really got to stand out on their own and become, you know, no, like recognizable uh, and become loved by fans. The story was innovative, innovative when it came out in 1990. A character-driven story starring Marth and his merry band of heroes. Uh, it, it had been done before, but I don't feel like it had been done on quite the scale of that many characters being involved in the story and having dialogue. I mean... A lot of times it was for just like a chapter or two at a time, but even then, like characters like Agma had more relevance in the story than you would see other faceless, you know, who would normally just be like a faceless army member number three in like a game, say Famicom Wars or other games, of the, other strategy games at the time. Gameplay wise, FE1 set the example for the rest of the series. You know, it's the game that started it all. It had the grid based combat. At battles that were determined by basic stats such as strength, speed, skill, and defense. It featured unique classes who specialize in different weapon types and have specialized stat distribution, which added to each character's place in the army. And also many characters uh, were able to promote from their starting class to a stronger class, which could strengthen a character's stats. The gameplay is fine, and again, it set the base for the entire series. It was fine for its time. Now it's antiquated. Really hard to go back to. Really slow. Really hard to play. But it was good for the time. <laughs> so what it all comes down to, again, for FE1, is that it's a game that came out in 1990. And looking at it and judging it based on games that are out today is unfair. So, again, FE1 is good for its time. That's like the number one thing we, one, number one thing we can take away from... Uh, older games, I feel like, is if we don't look at them through the 1990s glasses that we should look through for a game like FE1, then they're going to look bad by today's comparisons, right? But FE1, you know, was a strategy game that featured unique, well, mostly unique characters that could die, and that adds a layer of risk and war to the game. Risk in that your character could die forever, and reward in that you got to watch each soldier grow and become stronger statistically. Comparing that to a game like Famicom Wars, where, where nameless soldiers die time and time again and show no growth. These two factors of risk and reward personalize each player's play experience. Nobody's playthrough will be the same, ever. Either level ups will go differently, you'll choose different characters to level up, or even you'll let characters die, things will happen. FE1 may not be turning any heads these days, but we have it to thank for the following 14 games that we have enjoyed so much. It's been the base of everything. And even in the first trailer, we still see the roots of FE1 
in Fire Emblem Three Houses. Other than all the basics such as grid-based gameplay and a character-driven story, I would really like to see a small and simple thing return to Three Houses that was featured in Fire Emblem 1 and a couple of other Fire Emblem games as well, but originated in FE1. And that is Unlimited Warp. So Warp is a staff or magic ability that is seen throughout the series, but in all games after FE5, excluding the DS remakes, it has a limited range. So a staff user or magic user could go next to a player unit, select the warp staff or warp magic skill if you're playing FE2, FE2 or FE15, and choose to move them to a tra another traversable space anywhere on the map, as long as it was within their range. So in FE1, uh, 2, 3, and 5, and 11 and 12, those ranges were unlimited. They could be sent anywhere on the map. So you could send Marth right next to the boss, kill them, and then put him and see, put him on the throne and seize the next turn. Or you do even more strats like that. Now many people complain that unlimited warp can break the game, and they have a point. But I want to be given that option to break the game over my knee. I think that is a fun part of Fire Emblem. When I can think of fun strats that are outside of the box, whether it is using warp and rescue strats, you know, using the warp and rescue staff together in different combinations, or warping a bunch of people, warping someone there to kill the boss, and then warping your lord to seize, and just all sorts of different stuff. I think the game, and, and especially if the game is balanced around this broken warp or unlimited warp, similar to how like Thracia 776 made it take a ton of planning to set it up correctly, it can be reserved for advanced strats. It can be used by low turn count players, and even people who just want to beat the game in a fun and an inventive way. So there you have it. FE1 is an underappreciated game for all that it pulled off on the NES. Hopefully Three Houses learns from Fire Emblem 1 and allows the player to play the game they want, like the way they want to, and allows the player to break it over their knee if, if they choose to, by including things such as Unlimited Warp, but I don't want to be so broken that it trivializes the game. There's a balance that needs to be struck, but I think Three Houses could implement that very well, and I hope they choose to. Alright, thanks for listening, guys. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, all that good stuff. Definitely subscribe if you're into this series, which, again, I've call, I'm calling Looking Forward to Three Houses, or LFTH. Make sure to share it with your friends. There's going to be at least... 14 more episodes of this. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with Fates. I might break it up into three different episodes, but the way I'm thinking now, it's probably just going to be one, but that's a little ways down the road, so we'll see you later. Make sure to stay tuned, and I'll catch you guys next time.